off, brother. Sing with me, church. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of the glory, pour out your power and love, as we sing holy, 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 sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Father. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy. As we sing holy, holy, holy. Sing holy, church. We sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. We sing holy, holy. more time. We sing holy, 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 I want to see you. Yeah. What do you say, church? Give them praise this morning. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, it's really good to be in your house today. As we take a look back at the year we just lived out, there were highs, definitely some lows, but through it all, you've been a great father. I've heard 
thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased in that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. If I'm loved by you, it's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Well, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide because you know just what we need before we we say a word. You're a good. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are. Jesus, for being a great, great father to us, we give you all the praise and glory today. Give him praise, church. Hallelujah. Do yourselves a favor. Would you turn to a neighbor this morning, welcome somebody to church, and wish him Happy New Year, would you?
Well, we're going to continue to keep on worshiping this very last service of 2017. We're going to do so by giving back. If you came prepared this morning to give back to the kingdom, then this will be that time. The deacons will be around shortly. But most of all, let's pray and let's give thanks for everything that God has done. Father, we want to say thank you for the very air that we breathe. Without it, we would not be alive. And Lord, as we look forward to the hope of 2018, may you be in all of it. Help us, Lord, to make you number one in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for about you, it's all about you, Jesus. 
king of endless world No one could express How much you deserve And though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper in this Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to heart about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made When it's all about you It's all about you When it's all about you It's all about you, Lord When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus So we want to do that now, Father. We want to make it all about you. We want to be obedient to what you said. And you knew that being as human as we are, we would forget. And so you set the table for us. And so we come to that table this morning, Father and commune with you. If you did not receive the communion elements when you came in today, there are some to the right, your left, my right, and some over here on the opposite side. And just very simply, grab the elements, head back to your seats. And we're going to allow some time this morning to just be in his presence. Maybe for you, it's to look back at the year. Or maybe it's to look forward to the hope of 2018, some new things in your life. Whatever the case may be for you, let's just take a little bit of time to remember Jesus this morning and what he did on the cross. And then as the Spirit leads and guides you, go ahead and partake of his body.
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Jesus name When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand, sinking sand. Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He is all my hope and stay He is my hope and stay shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone for best to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground. Morning, church. Happy New Year. Pray you had a blessed Christmas. Looking forward to another exciting year. I don't know about you, with all that God has in store for us. We look over the past year as a staff, and we're very humbled and very amazed at what God has done and continuing to do in our midst. And thankful that you're a part of that. So God's blessings to you and God's blessings on you. If you're like me, you'll party hardy till about 9 o'clock tonight. Kiss the one you love and start snoring. That's the way the new year works at our house. Father, thank you for calling us together to this place, that we have a place that we can come to. Who would have ever thunk an old furniture store that was a packing warehouse before that, that now is a place for people to gather to honor you and serve you and grow into your likeness to give of our time and our energy and our resources our finances to make your kingdom what it needs to be that we can be a part of it so thank you for allowing us the privilege to be here to hang our hat here and thank you for the privilege of being used by you our gifts our talents our lives make a difference and so thank you 
for making a difference in our life. We just want to pay it forward. Bless every person who's here. You know the needs that are represented as we embrace a new year, as we are on the precipice of this new year. You know the challenges that lie ahead. You know the fears as well as the opportunities and the joys that will be present in this new year. And in all, we give you thanks and praise and consider you to be, as your scripture tells us, the blessed controller of all things in life. And so we rest in you. Bless the kingdom wherever it gathers today, other churches, places of worship. May we all be about your business. May our prayer be what you taught us to pray, that your kingdom would come, your will will be done here on earth. That's our prayer, as it is in heaven. To that end, we dedicate ourselves and ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you here this morning. In your bulletins, there's a lot of information. Just take the time to go through that. I just want to highlight that for the men's breakfast, we're back on schedule for this Tuesday at 6 a.m. If you're making some New Year's resolutions, guys, that's a great opportunity to come out and get to know some guys, have a great meal and a good time of worship and good time of teaching. So 6 o'clock on Tuesdays. Uh, women's study starts up in a couple of weeks, I believe it is, 16th, something like that. Uh, and it will be a study by Beth Moore called Entrusted. And I think there's a place, ladies, where you can go sign up for that study after the service out in the, the information area. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, also, a uh, ministry that's starting up is called Sew for Life. It's really a neat thing. Uh, a gal uh, came to us as the leadership with a vision to, uh, to sew uh, baby blankets and burp rags, cloths, I guess you call them, not rags, burp cloths and uh, crochet, uh, you know, hats and things like that for uh, newborns uh, to present to the Pregnancy Crisis Center as uh, moms are pregnant and contemplating whether they're going to keep their child or not. It's a gift that can be given to them. It's a way of stirring those maternal instincts that hopefully they'll keep the child and give it a chance for life. And then also the ministry is expanding. Uh, I think Providence Hospital is wanting us to do some things in other places as well. So. If you're interested in that, guys and gals, I say that because Rosie Greer, the great Los Angeles Ram football player, loved to crochet, so it's not just for women. Guys, gals, if you like to quilt, like to sew, like to crochet, whatever it is, next Sunday, uh, Vicki will be in the information area with the table set up, and you can talk to her more about that and how to get involved in that and what that ministry is about. So a lot of good stuff going on. We're glad you're here today. If you have your Bibles, I would ask you to open them and turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. If you're visiting with us for the first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, bring you up to speed. We are in a study that is called The Story. Uh, we have a book that we use. It's uh, chronologically scripture placed together, which gives us a, about a 30,000 foot view of the entire Bible. We're going through the entire Bible in a 31 week period of time. And uh, if you'd like to get a book, uh, we are out of them again. We order about two or three cases a week and we go through them. I think we're close to 2,000 that we've given out now. And uh, we'll have some more ordered. They'll be here next week. Uh, you can pick one up at the information area, uh, $7 if you can afford it. If not, don't worry about it. Pick one up. We want everybody to have one. If you are in the story following with us, chapter 14 is your assignment this week, chapter 14. We will be reading through the story together. Let me pick you up to speed where we were a couple of weeks ago. We took a week off for Christmas. But two weeks ago, we talked about the, the life of one of the kings of Israel. His name was Solomon. As you go back further in the story, you may remember that we talked about the time when God's people cried out for a king like all the other nations around them had. It wasn't enough for them that God would be their king. They wanted something with flesh and blood and bones. And so God said, fine, have it your way. The first king that God gave to Israel was a guy by the name of Saul. He started off pretty well, but he ended in a tailspin. His life was filled with all kinds of insecurities and aggressions as a result of those insecurities, and it ended in tragedy. Following Saul was a guy named David, probably the most recognizable king of Israel, the greatest king that ever lived in Israel's history. He was an interesting guy. David, I think, grew up in a very dysfunctional family. He was kind of the run of the litter. He was the one that everybody kind of forgot about, placed him out in the fields, but yet God is the one who selected him. He had a man, he was a man after God's own heart, 
which is an interesting statement when you look at David because he had his issues. He was an adulterer, he was a murderer, he, uh, he had some issues in his life, but the thing that made him so wonderful in God's eyes was the fact that in spite of his mistakes, he always knew where to go back to. He always came back to God in repentance and asking for forgiveness and allowed those things to strengthen his life, not defeat him. Following David, there was a guy named Solomon. Solomon was David's son, born to him through his relationship with Bathsheba. And Solomon was a guy that started off well as a king. He was a man of tremendous wisdom. You've probably heard the phrase, the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, people from around the world would come to uh, sit in front of Solomon and he would uh, answer their questions and give them advice. And, and yet there was an issue in Solomon's life that he didn't take care of. You may have remembered if you've been here that I, I talked about how we can find ourselves in a slow fade from God. You know, we, we don't start here one day and wind up over here the next, distant from God. It's not something that happens overnight. It's something that happens over time when we make a bad choice here and a poor decision there, and pretty soon we find ourselves way over here. Well, Solomon made some poor choices. He was instructed by God to not marry foreign women, but he disavowed uh, that advice, and instead he married 700 wives. He had 300 mistresses, and that's just mind-boggling to us. And as a result of that, those foreign wives that he married divided his heart. They brought their gods into his house. So he worshiped not only the God of Israel, but he began to worship pagan gods. And as a result of that, God pronounced judgment on Solomon's kingdom. If you notice on your outlines that I gave you, I've referenced a verse, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9 and verse 11. <coughs> Excuse me, and this is what the Lord said. The Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And so now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. So that's what we're going to talk about today. It's a period in Israel's history that's known as the divided kingdom. Because Solomon turned his back on God, God said, fine, but I'm going to take the kingdom from you. I'm not going to give it to one of your children. I'm going to give it to one of your servants. And as we'll see in our study, that didn't set well with Solomon. So he's going to disregard the advice of God who anoints a guy by the name of Jeroboam to be the next king of Israel. And we're going to see that Solomon disregards that anointing and instead appoints his own son, a guy by the name of Rehoboam, to be the next king of Israel. Now out of this story, let me draw some lessons for you and I. As I've shared with you uh, through the years, the things that we read about in Scripture are there for a purpose. They're not just history lessons to reveal to us how God moved and acted in time. They are lessons about how life can be lived, and from the mistakes of others, we can learn to avoid those mistakes ourselves. One of the things that we're going to see as we go through this story today is that the past has profound effects on the future. And by that, I mean the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. The decisions today become the past tomorrow, but those decisions we make affect our future. And so Solomon made some pretty bad decisions. And as a result of those decisions, the kingdom of Israel would be split in two. It would be divided. And the reason is this, because of the failed legacy of this unfaithful leader named Solomon. He dropped the ball. He, he missed the mark of what God had asked him to do and who God had asked him to be, and there were consequences attached to that. Many of you are, are, are here today and you're old enough to remember a very famous singer-songwriter in the 70s and the 80s by the name of John Denver. John Denver wrote songs like uh, Take Me Home Country Roads, Sunshine on My Shoulders, Rocky Mountain High. He was a very prolific artist in the 70s and the 80s. And you probably also remember, if you know of his story, that he died a very tragic death in a single engine plane crash. He was piloting the plane and it crashed off of the Pacific coast and he was killed on impact. The thing that's interesting about the story is that that crash could have been avoided had he paid attention 
to some of the details of the flight that he was engaged in. In fact, the National Transportation Board determined that the cause of the crash was, and I quote, the pilot's diversion of attention from the operation of the aircraft and inadequate pre-flight planning and preparations, specifically his failure to refuel the airplane. The Air Force has a saying they use while they're debriefing flight incidents, plane crashes. And this is the saying, the mishap has already occurred. The aircraft is now simply proceeding to the crash site. What happened in John Denver's case is he didn't pay attention to the details. He didn't do the proper pre-flight checks that a pilot is supposed to do before they get into an aircraft and take off for a destination. And so what happened to John Denver is exactly what the Air Force says happens when there's a crash. The mishap has already occurred. The aircraft is now simply proceeding to the crash site. In other words, it's an inevitable crash that's going to happen because there wasn't attention paid to the details beforehand. So John Denver had this habitual pattern, apparently. Uh, after the 8 o'clock service this morning, someone came up to me who actually knew John Denver's father. And his father repeatedly told John Denver, apparently, to do his pre-flight preparation and to make sure the plane was trustworthy, the tanks were full of fuel, and the levers were where they needed to be to transfer fuel when necessary. But because he didn't do that, that last plane flight of his was a recipe for disaster. So let's apply that to our study. If you remember in our study of Solomon in chapter 13, a couple of weeks ago, God's instructions to Solomon for, for keeping Israel on its flight path, for having a successful flight, were pretty clear. God says, keep the plane level, keep it full of fuel, and, and this is how you're going to do that. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 17, the Lord said, As for you, if you faithfully follow me as David your father did, obeying all my commands, decrees, and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty forever. God says, it's simple, Solomon. Just do what I ask you to do. Stay on the flight plan and keep the plane level and keep it full of fuel, and we'll wind up where we need to be. Those were the flight manual instructions for Solomon. But by the time we get to chapter 14 in our study, or 1 Kings chapters 12 through 16, if you want to read the entirety of the narrative in your Bible, the, the flight plan that God gave to Solomon is completely abandoned. Solomon pursued all the wrong things. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He rejected what God told him to do. He didn't follow the instructions that God gave to him. And so as a result, the kingdom that God had given to Solomon to rule over would be divided in two. It's known as the divided kingdom history of Israel. There would be 10 tribes that would split off and go to the north that became known as the nation of Israel, whose capital was at a town called Samaria whose king would eventually become a guy by the name of Jeroboam, the guy that initially God anointed to become the new king over united Israel. And the kingdom to the south became known as the kingdom of Judah. Its capital was at Jerusalem. And it had two tribes, and its king became Solomon's son, Rehoboam. So to rephrase what the Air Force would say, the sin had already occurred in the life of Solomon, so Israel was simply proceeding to the crash site. It was inevitable because of the failed legacy, the failed leadership of one man, the kingdom of Israel would suffer greatly. The crash of Israel was due to pilot error. And so this is what I want to focus on today. And I really love the timing of God because it fits very well with bringing in a new year. If I could bring it home, I would say this. The decisions we make today affect the generations that follow in either a positive or a negative way. Every day, you and I are faced with little decisions that seem inconsequential at the time, 
but when added up, reveal a pattern that is either going to influence positively or negatively the people that God brings into our sphere of influence. Let me say it this way. Our present decisions will one day be the past to which future generations will be able to trace their blessings or hardships. And so here's my simple question. As we embrace a new year, as we begin to think about our lives and where they're headed, the simple question is this. Are you following the flight plan that God has given to you? If you're here today and you're a husband, are you following the flight plan that God has given you as a husband? Are you loving your wife as Christ loved the church? In other words, sacrificially giving your life away to your bride. If you're a wife today, are you respecting your husband because of that love and submitting to his leadership that God has given in the home? If you're a, a father, are you being the father that God has called you to be? If you're a mother, are you being the mother that God has called you to be? If you are a son or a daughter, are you responding to your parents in the way that the scripture says you are, to respect your parents. And I realize that some of you were raised in absolutely horrendous circumstances. I know that because my wife was raised in one. But it doesn't negate the responsibility that we have to still respect our parents for the very fact that they gave life to us. If you are an employer, are you being the best employer that you can to bring honor and glory to God and build your company. If you're an employee, are you being the best employee? If you're a church member, are you being the best church member that you can possibly be, giving your life away and using your resources wisely for the kingdom? So where are you going? It's a great question to ask as you embrace a new year. But there's another profound part of the story that is equally important, not only where you're going, but secondly, I would ask, who are you listening to? Because there's a, a multitude of voices that are speaking into our life. And there's an important truth to remember. You might want to write this down. The counsel we receive can either help or hurt our future. A lot of people speaking into our lives, but is it words that we need to heed and listen to, or is it counsel that we should avoid? We need to pay very close attention to that. Uh, I'm not one to get into politics. I've learned my lessons on that through the years. It does no value to do so, I don't believe. But I will say to this, I, I, get, I get very wearisome of the, the rhetoric that is out in the world today about the society that so many people feel we should be. And let me just give you an example of what I experienced this week. On uh, Thursday and Friday of this week, we, my wife and I took our oldest grandson, Noah, to uh, a Portland Trailblazer game. So we went up to Portland on Thursday and, uh, and uh, checked into a hotel downtown and had a lot of fun, rode the Max train to the Trailblazer game on Thursday night. By the way, my wife and I would still be on that train if Noah hadn't been with us to decipher the routes and where we needed to get off and get on. It, you know, it's just like, Noah, tell us where we need to go. He was awesome. And then on uh, Friday morning, I said, Noah, where do you want to go to breakfast? And uh, he said, I want to go to Pine State Biscuits. Have you ever been to Pine State Biscuits, anybody? Eh, it's okay. I mean, you stand for an hour and a half in a line that wraps around a building to get a biscuit. So, you know, they're, they're, they're. Which is fine. So we did that. And, and uh, but here's my point. We got up to the door to go into the, to the uh, restaurant, and there was a, uh, a flag that had been created out of a piece of paper. And it was a flag just all about diversity. And I'm, I'm fine with that. That's fine. People have the right to say where they want, and you love them no matter what. But I, I was really incensed by the, the rhetoric on the sign was just all about uh, inclusiveness of, uh, of people that are not in the, the sphere of conservatism or, or Christians. Uh, for instance, you know, it was, we are of the belief that you know, black lives matter. My response would be, yeah, they do, but all lives matter. You know, why don't we be respective of all peoples regardless of what they believe? And so, you know, what my point is that there's all these voices that are just speaking. So who are we listening to? Where are we getting our counsel from? And let me just go on record with a disclaimer. 
it shouldn't be Fox News and it shouldn't be CNN. It should be the, the living God who gives us his counsel through his word. Does that make sense? So, so here's the situation. Okay, I'm done with my political speech for the year. Here, here's the situation that we find in 1 Kings chapter 12, where I've asked you to turn in your Bibles. Solomon has allowed his heart to become divided. He, he has put excessive taxes on the people. He is also forcing them into very hard labor to build these great projects that he wanted to build for his legacy. If I could paraphrase it this way, it was no different then than it was for God's children when they were in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. And so the people are being oppressed. They're being taxed very heavily, and they're in bondage. And so Solomon dies, and he hands the kingdom not to Jeroboam, who was anointed by God, and Solomon was told by God, this is who I'm going to give it to, but Solomon says, no, that's fine, God, you can do what you want, but I'm doing it my way. And so his final act before he dies is he disobeys God and gives it to his son Rehoboam. And Rehoboam takes over the leadership of Israel, and it just goes on this tailspin that becomes unrecoverable. And this is what we read about in 1 Kings chapter 12, and it's all because Rehoboam followed some pretty unwise counsel. Look in verse 3 of 1 Kings 12. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. So Jeroboam should have been the king. Rehoboam gets it because Solomon gives it to him. Now Jeroboam and the rest of Israel, the leaders, want to speak with Rehoboam. This is what they said. Your father was a hard master. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us, and then we will be your loyal subjects. In other words, let's turn the ship around. Let's get it headed in the right direction. Let's ease up on people and make life a little easier for them. King Rehoboam said, give me three days to think this over and then come back for my answers. And the people went away. Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had counseled his father Solomon. What is your advice, he asked. How should I answer these people? And the older counselors replied, if you are willing to be a servant to these people today and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. In other words, treat them with respect and they'll treat you with respect. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the young men who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. What is your advice? He asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? And the young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. So you've got this older segment of his leadership council that has some wisdom who sat under the leadership of his father, who saw the mistakes that he made and said, hey, if you learn from your father's mistakes, you can be a good king. And then he has the counsel of his young cronies who say, I want you to be even harder than your father was. Let me just say this. For the church, you need the wisdom of the elders and you need the youth and vitality of the younger generation. But both are needed. And Rehoboam listens to his cronies, disregards the advice of the wisdom of the elders, and as a result of that, the people are going to rebel. This is when the kingdom splits. And so when the people of Israel hear what he's going to do, they said, fine, we're out of here. And so ten tribes go north, Jeroboam becomes their king, two tribes go south, Rehoboam becomes their king. All because he listened to very unwise counsel. Even Solomon, Rehoboam's father, understood the value of good counsel, even though he rejected it himself. But he wrote these words in Proverbs, Foolishness brings joy to those with no sense 
a sensible person stays on the right path. Plans go wrong for lack of advice, but many advisors bring success. You want success in 2018? Then who are you listening to? Who are you allowing to speak into your life? Is it the truth of what God has to say about life, or is it something that is contrary to that truth? So, we have these options. The counsel we receive can help or hurt us. And here's the last point that I want to draw out and bring home to you. Failing to follow the truth, when you know what the truth is and you fail to follow it, brings disastrous consequences. So Rehoboam's decision splits the nation in two. I mean, Solomon, if Solomon couldn't even agree on what God to worship and he hands that down to his son Rehoboam, how could there possibly be any unity to bring the people together? And so the kingdom divides in two. And these kings, neither one of them fared well. Both of them had their issues. If you look at Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 through 30, you see the mistakes that he made. He's the king to the north. Remember Jeroboam? I know there's a lot of bones. Jeroboam, king of Israel to the north. In verse 26 of chapter 12, Jeroboam thought to himself, unless I am careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David, which would be out of the tribe of Judah. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, they will again give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and make him their king instead. And so here's a guy, a leader, he's very insecure. When you have a leader who's insecure, you got problems because he's going to start looking out for himself. And so now we see Jeroboam going, well, wait a minute, the people are going to go back down into Judah to Jerusalem to worship. I can't let that happen. i got to keep my people close by. And so on the advice of his counselors, the king made two gold calves. He said to the people, it's too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. So he introduces idolatry right back into the nation. And he says, you guys don't need to take the trip down south. Save your money. Take the miles off of your chariots and all create a thing to worship right here at home. Well, how did that fare? Well, if you look in chapter 14 of 1 Kings, verses 8 and 9, this is what you read. The Lord says to Jeroboam, I ripped the kingdom away from the family of David and gave it to you, but you have not been like my servant David, who obeyed my commands and followed me with all his heart and always did whatever I wanted. Listen to this. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made other gods for yourself and have made me furious with your gold calves. And since you have turned your back on me, I will bring disaster on your dynasty. And history shows us that happened. In 733 BC, the nation of Israel would be taken captive by the great Assyrian army and led into, a, into captivity. So King Jeroboam didn't fare well. The same was true for Rehoboam to the south. If you look in chapter 14, verses 21 through 24, this is what we read about him. Meanwhile, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was king in Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen from among all the tribes of Israel as the place to honor his name. Rehoboam's mother was Nama, an Ammonite woman. During Rehoboam's reign, the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, provoking his anger with their sin, for it was even worse than that of their ancestors. For they also built for themselves pagan shrines and set up sacred pillars and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every green tree. There were even male and female shrine prostitutes throughout the land. The people imitated the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. What's the point? point is this, you might want to write it down. It never goes right when we try to do it our own way. When we have no regard for what God has to say or how life should be lived, and we just begin to head down a path that everybody else is traveling down, or everybody is doing this, so we should do it, or everybody says this is the right way. Well, is it really? What does God have to say about every bit of counsel that we're receiving? Solomon again, if he would have only listened to his words of wisdom, he said there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Let me ask you again. 
Where are you traveling? What's your flight plan for 2018? Where are you going? Who are you listening to? What's the counsel you're receiving about how life should be lived? Listen, if we want to be remembered for the right things, then we have to make the right choices and we have to do the right things. It's just that simple. If you want to pass on a legacy in your family, if you want to be remembered for being a godly father or a godly mother, a godly husband or a godly wife, a godly parent, if you want to have children that follow you who are going to imitate your steps, then those steps have to be directed towards the Lord if you want your children to follow in the same direction. I have a passion in my life. I've been very blessed, and I humbly say this, with three awesome daughters who are deeply, passionately committed to Jesus Christ, who have married three incredible men. Their homes are covered by the grace and mercy of God. They've given me seven incredible grandchildren, and it is my mission and my wife's mission to pour our lives into our grandchildren, to help them follow the legacy of their grandma and their grandpa and their mom and their dad, that they too will carry the torch of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. If you will honor God in the present, then God will bless you in the future. If you're wanting to be blessed, then make a decision today to honor God now. So where are you headed? Ask yourself that. And some of you today are playing with fire. You know it. You're trying to live your life over here one way, and you're trying to live your life over here another way. There's a sinful part of your life that would collapse your world if anyone found out. And God says it's time. It's time to get away from a divided heart and make a decision to fully follow the Lord. No doubt, being New Year's Eve, you've probably made some resolutions, and I think that's all well and good. Maybe you've decided that you're going to eat a little healthier this year. We're committed to help you do that. Just so you know, in 2018, we're going to introduce you to the Daniel Plan. We're going to encourage you to embark with us on an eating lifestyle that is healthy and biblical. Maybe you're here today, and, and you're going to make some decisions to exercise more. You know, you're going to place the cookie jar about 10 feet further from where your couch is than it was this year, so you can get a little more exercise going back and forth. Maybe you've made a decision that you're going to get rid of some kind of habit. You know, maybe you're, you're a smoker and you decided, that's not healthy, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to get rid of that. Those are all well and good. Those are good decisions. But what we've been talking about this morning is so much more important because we're talking about decisions that will affect your influence now and into eternity. That's critical. It really is. I believe as a nation, as a people, we're at critical mass where it's time for us who name Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to make commitments to honor that, that what we say. So if you're here today and you've been flying recklessly, I want to challenge you to use this time to stop and think. Where are you headed? Are you just proceeding to an eventual crash site? Or are you flying by the control of God's spirit and God's truth in your life? Are you allowing him to navigate your life? Maybe like John Denver, you've been cutting corners. You've been diverting your attention from what you know you should be doing. And if that's the case, I just want you to know that it's never too late to change. In fact, the whole point of, of the story is that it's never too late to begin writing a new chapter in your life if that's what you really want. And that can begin today. And it can make a difference for future generations. Maybe it's time for you to, uh, to prime the pump of your life. Let me illustrate what I mean true story of a couple of guys, one guy named Brandon, the other guy's name was Jimmy. They were a couple of good old southern boys, lived in southern Alabama. They were out driving in the hills of southern Alabama one afternoon on a hot August day, and they got thirsty. They didn't have 
any water to drink and so Brandon was driving he saw an old abandoned farmhouse and he thought you know I bet there's an old well in the back of the house so he pulled off and they jumped out and sure enough the back of the old farm was one of those handled pumps that you pump to get the water up and so Brandon went right to the pump and he just starts cranking on the pump as hard as he get can get he's hot, he's sweating, he's getting thirstier, and he's pumping, and he's pumping, and he's pumping, and nothing's coming out, and then he finally realizes, you know, I think what needs to happen is the pump needs to be primed, and he noticed a little creak, and he said to Jimmy, why don't you go down there and get a little water and bring it back, because if I'm going to get anything out down here, i got to put something in up here. By the way, does that sound a lot like life? If I want to get something out down here, i got to put something in up here. There's a lot of people who are kind of standing by the fireplace of life looking to get warm, but it just doesn't work that way. You, you got to go out and you got to find the wood and bring it in and build the fire before you can get warm. You, you got to pour something in before you can get something out. There's a lot of people who I know who say, I'm going to go ask my, my boss for a raise this year. And I'm going to tell them, if you give me the raise, then I'll be sure I'll be at work on time and I'll do the things that you ask me to do. It doesn't work that way. You want to get a raise down here, then you better pour something in up here. You better be on time and do the things that your employer asks you to do. And then maybe, having poured in here, you'll get out down here. You're probably at a place where you're going, Lord, I just want to be blessed this year. I'm tired of life as the way it is, and I'm asking you to bless my life. If you want the blessings of God down here, you got to pour in up here. you got to say, Lord, my life is yours. I'm going to give my life to you. Lord, my finances are yours. I'm going to give my finances to you. Oh, wait a minute, Tom. You're saying that I'm supposed to give 10% of my money to God? I'm saying, no, 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 not at all. I'm saying God says to you, I'm going to let you keep 90%. And I'm going to take that 10%, and I'm going to do something that is absolutely miraculous. I'm going to build my church on that 10%. You want the blessings of God here, but you haven't poured in here. Maybe 2018 is a good time for you to go, Lord... Where do I need to pour in here? Where do I need to give my life away? Where do I need to serve? Where do I need to give more so that I can receive more on this end? And so, oh, Brandon, man, he's pumping away, and he's primed the pump, but there's no water coming out. And he finally he's getting tired, and he says to Jimmy, he says, I, I don't think there's any water here. I'm going to stop. And Jimmy goes, no, 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 don't stop, don't stop. You know the wells here, they're deep. And that's good because... It takes deep wells to give the best water that's fresh and clean and pure and cold. So keep pumping. Some of you have been pumping for a while and you're getting tired. But I'm saying to you, don't stop pumping because the good things of God are deep. And he's going to see how willing we are to keep the effort going. It's time to prime the pump. Uh, you know, I, I try to be very open and honest with you guys about my life. I've made my mistakes, man. I'm sure you have too. But I'll tell you something. My wife and I talk about it all the time. At our age, undertaking an adventure like this I would be lying to you if there were times when I said, I'm scared to death, man. I'm too old for this. <laughs> and you know what we just keep coming back to? We just had this conversation yesterday. As I was going over my sermon. I run it by her before I teach it to you. And what'd she say to me? Yes. We just got to do what? We just got to keep keep priming the pump. We just have to keep priming the pump. Because this isn't Tom's church. This isn't Jane's church. This isn't Jimmy's church. This is God's church. And God can do anything He wants. 
as long as there are people who are willing to read the flight plan, do the pre-flight checks, keep our life where it needs to be, and keep priming the pump. And if we'll all do that, I think we'll be amazed as we look back at the end of 2018 if God doesn't come before of what God could do through lives just like ours. Amen. Let's pray. God, you're faithful. You just are. And so my simple prayer is just help us be faithful to you. We know what needs to happen in our lives for that to take place. So let it happen, I pray, for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be down here, other people. Pastor Jimmy's here to pray with you. If you have any needs today, other than that, God bless you guys. Let's text each other at 9 o'clock. Wish each other Happy New Year and enjoy a good night's sleep, okay? God bless you guys.